Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to tonight's second half, which is absolutely disturbing, and you will soon see why I say that. Before we get into it, a couple links. As you all know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch is displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost a cent. Click that like button. takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because these things, they really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they really do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half, shall we? All right, guys, so the videos that you are going to see in this upload are absolutely disturbing. I've never seen anything like it. Um, they are not online because one, they were taken by my best friend who lives in Miami, Florida. And two, he has not posted them anywhere. Uh, so I will kind of give you a brief rundown of what you are going to see uh, during the video. But let's get into some encounters quick and then we'll jump into the videos. All right, really quick, I'd like to point something out in the title, Reptilians. Now, to me, this is kind of proof that the government would like to not debunk, but to dissuade us from even believing in any kind of creature like this. It'll only be a matter of time before Dogman is, or Bigfoot, will be highlighted under the video. You can see under this video, under the title where it says Reptilians, and it gives you a uh, Wikipedia definition. <laughs> Wikipedia. Uh, for those of you who do not know, you can actually go into a Wikipedia. You can look up a person, you can look up a topic, and you can go in and change the wording of that. How crazy is that? They know these things exist. They know they're dangerous. They know how dangerous they are because the government works hand in hand with these things. These reptilians could be possible, could possibly be the creators of the crawler. They could also be what is responsible for the genetic makeup of Dogman and Bigfoot. Who knows? I don't. But it's pretty interesting to think about. Let's get into it. The first week of February is a beautiful time of year in the northern Sonoran Desert, east of Tucson, Arizona. Perfect conditions for extended mountain bike excursions into remote areas that feature stately saguaro cactus, large patches of rabbit ear and prickly pear cactus, and desert wildlife that includes javelina, red Mexican wolves, roadrunners, coyotes, and plenty of smaller animals that make full use of the mild temperatures. Another plus for this early springtime time period is that the desert's more deadly residents, such as many varieties of poisonous snake, Gila monster, and nasty bark scorpions, have yet to emerge from their winter hibernation. It was in this idyllic time period that three Tucson bicyclists decided to tackle the tough 17-mile-old Pueblo race course east of town the first week of February 2014. One of the cyclists, local Tucson business owner, G. Johnson, described the scene. 
It's a tough one. It's a 24-hour trek, so you better come prepared with more than enough food and water. There are times you just want to go back and wish you had never got there in the first place. But when you see what nature has to offer you here, well, those regrets dissipate rather quickly. The cyclists set out, and according to Johnson, when they had reached around the halfway point of the course, when they had a highly unexpected encounter that could have been part of the desert-tinged episode of the Twilight Zone. We had been riding for about, I don't know, maybe nine hours taking breaks every now and then. Then Michael says he needs to stop for a moment. We wait for him to finish when all of a sudden we see this long figure walking across the trail. He's maybe six feet tall, very, very skinny, and has an awkward gait, like a monkey, or a man with a disease, almost robotic. The men were understandably startled and checked with each other if each of them were seeing what they were seeing. Then all I remember about Michael is him saying, what the hell is that, or something like that. But he sounded far away. He probably used a different word instead of hell. Thing is, we had somehow walked a little towards the thing. Don't ask me why. Maybe to look at it better, not knowing what it was. The creature seemed out of place, even though it appeared to blend into the desert surroundings. Johnson continued his description of the encounter. He stopped, and it made eye contact with me, and I could see him clearly. The eyes were kind of like a snake's, but black with a yellow stripe in the middle of the eye. It had red and green scales on its face and head. The red color was kind of like the same as the desert sand there, and it looked like it had sandy texture too. It didn't have a nose, only two holes on it. I couldn't see any ears or hair, the red mouth that looked like it had blood around it, but it didn't look like it was bleeding. It looked like a pattern and reminded me of a chameleon, but it looked like a person as well. Then it appeared to the witnesses that the creature rised up on its long arms with strange-looking claws that looked like a branch full of thorns, and it gestured at them, with a loud chattering sound was heard. The sound seemed to be the creature rapidly rattling its teeth. Then it scurried away in a way that reminded the witnesses of a lizard trying to hide. He looked like he was examining us, and then he ran into the desert. We thought about going back the same way we came, but we thought it didn't matter since we were in the middle of the track anyway. We were scared, to be honest. None of us had ever seen anything like it. It lasted only a few seconds, but felt longer than that, at least to me. So, after we talked about it for a while, we decided to go on and finish the track. The men were rattled by their experience, and after talking about what to do, decided to continue on their way and finish the bike course. When you read these stories online or watch them on TV, well, you think, man, these people are crazy on meds or something, or in need of attention. But this made me a believer. There has to be more of them out there. If there's one, there's got to be two, at least, right? I know most people won't believe a word I said. That's the way I used to be. And I don't blame them at all, but they are out there. Now I'm not saying this is an alien or a chukacabra or anything like it. All I'm saying is I've never seen anything like it in my life. But I'm no biologist, so what do I know? The history of lizard men sightings goes back many generations. Native American legends speak of this reptilian being inhabiting the earth when their ancestors roamed the western portion of what is now the United States. And there are quite a number of petroglyphs that have an uncanny resemblance to what look like upright bipedal lizards. On October 28, 1878, the Louisville Courier Journal carried the interesting story about a scaly wild man of the woods that had been killed and was on display for public view. Of course, today, wild man generally refers to 
Bigfoot type creatures, like the Minnesota Iceman that was briefly displayed in the 60s. But this 19th century version was described as being about six feet tall with large eyes and covered with scales. The strange being was viewed by hundreds of curious and somehow disappeared in history, never to be seen again. The California Lizard Man Lizard Man reports of humanoid reptoids have been reported for generations in California. A fortune hunter in the 1940s claimed that he had stumbled on a labyrinth of a labyrinth of an underground tunnel filled with gold under Los Angeles. He claimed that a race of lizard people were responsible for its construction. January 29th, 1934 article in Los Angeles Times authored by Jean Basquiat gave its readers a thrill when it first broke the story. Lizard People's Catacomb City engineer sink shaft under Fort Moore Hill to find a maze of tunnels and priceless treasures of legendary inhabitants. Busy L.A., although little realizing it in the hustle and bustle of modern existence, stands above a lost city of catacombs filled with treasure and imperishable records of the race of humans further advanced intellectually than the highest type of present-day people. In the belief of G. Warren Shufield, geologist, mining engineer, who engaged in an attempt to rest from the lost city deep in the earth below Fort Moore Hill, the secrets of the lizard people of legendary fame in the medicine lodges of the Native Americans. So firmly does Shufeld and his little staff of assistants believe that the maze of catacombs at priceless gold tablets are to be found beneath downtown L.A., that the engineer and his aides have already driven a 250-foot shaft into the ground. The mouth of the shaft, beginning in the old Banning property of North Hill Street, overlooking Sunset Boulevard, Spring Street, and Northern Broadway. And so convinced is the engineer of the infallible of the radio x-ray perfected by him for detecting the presence of minerals and tunnels below the surface of the ground, an apparatus with which he says has been tracing patterns of the catacombs and vaults forming the lost city, that he plans to continue sending his shaft downward until he reaches a depth of a thousand feet before discontinuing his operations. Schufeld learned of the legend of the lizard people after his radio x-ray had led him over an area extending from the public library on West 5th Street to the Southwest Museum on Museum Drive at the foot of Mount Washington. I knew I was over a pattern of tunnels, the engineer explained, and I had mapped out a course of tunnels, the position of large rooms scattered along the tunnel route as well as a position of deposits of gold, but I couldn't understand the meaning of it. Then Shufelt was taken to Little Chief Greenleaf of the Medicine Lodge of the Hopi Indians in Arizona, whose English name is L. McLean. The Indian provided the engineer with a legend which, according to both men, dovetails exactly with what Shufelt says he had found. According to the legend as imparted to Shufield by McCacklin, the radio x-ray has revealed the location of one of the three lost cities on the Pacific coast, the local one having been dug by the lizard people after the great catastrophe, which occurred about 5,000 years ago. This legendary catastrophe was in the form of a huge tongue of fire, which came up of the southwest, destroying all in its path. The path being several hundred miles wide, the city underground was dug as a means of escaping future fires. The lost city dug with powerful chemicals by the lizard people instead of pick and shovel, was drained into the ocean, where its tunnels began according to the legend the tide passing daily in and out of the lower tunnel portals and forcing air into the upper tunnels, providing ventilation, 
and cleansed and sanitized the lower tunnels, the legend states. Large rooms in the domes of the hill above the city of labyrinths housed thousands of families in the manner of tall buildings, and imperishable food supplies of herb variety were stored in the catacombs to provide substance for the lizard folk for a great length of time as the next fire swept over the earth. The lizard people, the legends have it, regard the lizard as a symbol of long life. Their city is laid out like a lizard, according to the legend. Its tail to the southwest, far below 5th and Hope Streets. Its head to the northeast, at Lookout and Murata Streets. The city's key room is situated directly under South Broadway, near 2nd Street, according to Shufield and the legend. This key room is the directory to all the parts of the city and to all record tablets. The legend states all records were to be kept on golden tablets. Four feet long and 14 inches wide, one of these tablets of gold, gold having been the symbol of life to the legendary lizard people, will be found the record of history of the Mayans and on one particular tablet, the southwest corner of which will be missing, is found the record of the origin of the human race. Schufelt stated he has taken x-ray pictures of 37 such tablets, three of which have their southwest corners cut off. Shufield stated that he has taken x-ray pictures of 37 such tablets, three of which have their southwest corners cut off. My radio x-ray pictures of the tunnels and rooms, which are subsurface voids, and of gold pictures with perfect corners, sides, and ends, are scientific proof of their existence. Shufield said, however, the legendary story must remain speculative and unearthed by excavation. The lizard people, according to Macklin, were of a much higher type of intellectual than modern human beings. The intellectual accomplishments of their nine-year-old children were equal to those of present-day college graduates, he states. So greatly advanced scientifically were these people that in addition to perfecting a chemical solution by which they bored underground without removing any earth and rock, they also developed a cement far stronger and better than any in use of modern times, which they lined their tunnels and rooms. Other locales in California have also produced reports over the years. The following decade, in the 50s, a man driving near Riverside, California, claimed he narrowly missed hitting a lizard man crossing the road. Mount Shasta area has been the site of reports of underground dwelling lizard men. Other Southern California stories also mention human-like reptilians, including some that sound like large upright iguanas that are often associated with caves and tunnels. There are also reports of water-dwelling lizard type that are said to live in Lake Eleanor, described as having spines running the length of their spine in an extremely shy disposition. These creatures are reported of water monsters and spiny-backed water lizards. Native American legends and some Vaga reports have also surfaced in the lower Colorado River, but no rumors have any documentation to substantiate them to my knowledge. The Black Mountain Reptilian Encounter now, desert encounters with so-called lizard men that lurk in a secret around the world are rare, but they are occasionally reported, case in point. In 1977, Sherry Hinkle lived on the outskirts of Henderson, Nevada, and she recalled a strange encounter reported by her 13-year-old son Mark and a friend who were exploring near the slopes of Black Mountain. That is home to many TV, radio, and communication towers, towers that feed the Las Vegas region. The area is dotted with abandoned mines and caves, and the place was off limits to the boys. But, boys being boys, they decided to explore the area anyway, according to Hinkle. 
They hiked maybe the scant one mile across the desert and climbed the little hills in front of Black Mountain. On the back side of one of those little hills, Mark and Harry located a cave. They had to squirm into the narrow opening and belly crawl through the cave to a larger room and turn on their small pocket flashlights. They saw a circular room, roughly nine feet across. Near the back wall, they spotted a large, deeper hole. They found several large branches that someone had dragged a couple large branches about a mile from the closest tree and tossed the branches into the hole, creating a makeshift ladder to climb down into the lower pit. The pit was roomy, with a short annex. Occasional debris littered the rocky floor, like a tin can or two. A battered teen magazine perched on a small outcrop of rock that served as a shelf. The boys explored the main cave, then turned their attention to the short tunnel or annex and heard the sounds of voices and maybe the distant humming of machines. Intrigued by the thought of them mining nearby, the boys went deeper into the tunnel. On the far end, they found a rusty metal door, and near the door, a strange metal rod. The one-foot rod was lightweight and resembled aluminum, with a cap on one end and a few strange engravings on the other side. Startled, the boys heard the sound of guttural, harsh voices talking and the certain sound of approaching footsteps. The boys became frightened by the strange vocalizations and hightailed it to their makeshift ladder and headed out toward the cave entrance on the upper level. As they exited, they heard what sounded like the metal door opening, its old metal screeching. They crawled out of the tunnel opening and ran away from the cave entrance, thinking they were safe. They breathed a sigh of relief. Without warning, they heard a loud, threatening growl. Harry and Mark looked back at the cave entrance, and to their horrified eyes, they watched as a very large, greenish humanoid struggled to force his big body out of that narrow cave. The boys screamed and started running down the slope of the hill, running top speed. They didn't look back until they were near my yard. Now the two boys excitedly told Sherry of their encounter and produced the strange metal rod for her to examine. The rod was approximately one and a half inches across, maybe a foot long, with a slight indentation at one end, and a plain gray cap on the other. I looked at this bizarre symbols engraved in the three-inch section of the rod. It was just symbols of spirals, circles in different sizes, a few triangles, and a few unknown symbols. There were no levers or buttons, and the cap at the end didn't seem to move. The rod, with its professionally created symbols and smooth to the touch, I knew it was not a toy, but nothing I recognized. One would think that this would be the end of the encounter, but as it turns out, according to Hinkle, the lizard men wanted their rod back. After the excitement of the encounter, it was difficult to get Mark and her other three kids to bed. But after some convincing, they went to his bedroom to get the much-needed night's rest. Then the nightmarish events began. It must have been around two in the morning when Mark shook me, whispering harshly that someone was trying to get into his bedroom window. I hoped it was just a nightmare or his nerves were still on edge. Quietly, we slipped into his bedroom and listened to the sounds of scraping at the window's edge. He was not mistaken. In the light of the moon, I could make out a silhouette of head and shoulders of a man. I was alone with my four kids, no husband to protect us, so I grabbed my flashlight. Suddenly, tossing the curtains open to face this man. There was a glare from the flashlight on the window, but past the glare I could clearly see a large head with ridges on the top, other ridges on his cheekbones, and the glow of golden eyes. Mark and I stood still, unmoving. Both fear and shock kept us frozen. The lizard man didn't move either, his hand still poised in his attempt to pry the window open. His hand was large, with webbed, rough, gnarly-looking fingers with powerful claws. After a couple of minutes, not seconds, but long, 
agonized minutes with our hearts pounding. I knew I had to do something. One hand still holding the flashlight beam on his face and my eyes still locked into those golden eyes, I fumbled around in the dark with my other hand, hoping to find something to use as a weapon if needed. He glanced at my hand, looked back into my eyes. He turned his head a little, as if he was asking a question. He slightly opened his lipless lips, displaying four of his pointed teeth, and suddenly he turned and ran off into the desert. As with the vast majority of stories that feature physical evidence and accounts too strange to be believed, the frightened mother of four decided that the rod must be returned to the cave. Later in the morning, we decided the reason the lizard man was breaking into the house was to reclaim the metal rod. Mark and I hiked back to the cave and placed the strange rod beside the cave entrance. Of course, my first question would be, did they take any photographs or video of the rod or attempt to shave off any of the metal for later analysis? This article doesn't mention any attempts to document their seemingly unbelievable account, but does mention hearing of other sightings of weird humanoid types in the area. We're given no dates, names, or descriptions. The Lizard Man of Scape or Swamp The most sensational and well-known Lizard Man report was a series of sightings of what became known as the Lizard Man of Scape or Swamp, also the Lizard Man of Lee County. This East Coast version is a reptilian humanoid thought to inhabit areas of swampland in and around Lee County, South Carolina. Some speculate that the creature also utilizes the sewers in abandoned tunnels in towns located near the swamp. The lizard man is generally described as being seven feet tall, bipedal, and bulky, covered in dark hair and scaly lizard-like skin on its hands, feet, and face. It is said to have three toes on each foot and three fingers on each hand. The creature has an incredible degree of strength, more than capable of ripping into a car. A few witnesses have reported seeing a tail, although in the majority of cases a tail was not seen. Texas crypto hunter and researcher Lyle Blackburn has recently published an excellent book on the skateboard swamp lizard man of South Carolina titled Lizard Man that details the various sightings and encounters of the strange reptilian being. The first official sighting of the creature was made by Christopher Davis, a 17-year-old, who claimed he encountered the creature while driving home from work late at night on June 29, 1988. Davis had stopped on the road, bordering Scape or Swamp, in order to change a tire, and as he was finishing, he heard a thumping noise from behind him, turned around to see the frightening-looking creature running at him. He said the creature tried to grab at the car and then jumped on the roof as he tried to drive away. Davis swerved from side to side in effort to throw it off the top of the car, but the creature managed to hang on for a distance. When he returned home, Davis found that his side view mirror was damaged and scratch marks was found on the roof. I looked back and saw something running across the field towards me. It was about 25 yards away, and I saw red, glowing eyes. I ran into the car, and as I locked it, the thing grabbed the door handle. I could see him from the neck down. The three big fingers, long black nails, and green rough skin. It was strong and angry. I looked in my mirror and saw a blur of green running. I could see his toes, and then he jumped on the roof of my car. I thought I heard a grunt, and then I could see his fingers through the side front windshield, where they curled around the roof. I sped up and swerved to shake the creature off. Davis went to the Lee County Sheriff's Office July 16, 1988, and filed a report with Sheriff Liston Truesdale after hearing of another similar encounter that had been reported. On the morning of July 14, 1988, deputies made their way to the residence of Tom and Mary Way. 
located in a small rural community known as Brown Town on the outskirts of Bishopville, South Carolina. The couple showed the officers the vehicle they claimed had been mauled. The chrome molding had been torn away from the, around the fenders. The sidewall tires were scratched, the hood ornament was broken off, the antenna was bent, and upon closer inspection it appeared that parts of the molding had actually been chewed on, as if an animal had used its teeth to inflict the damage. The ways pointed out the clumps of reddish-colored hair and muddy footprints that had been left all over the car. News of Sheriff Truesdale's visit spread around the neighborhood, and other locals came forward with their story. Truesdale told reporters later, While we are looking over the situation, we learned that people in Brown Town community had been seeing a strange creature about seven feet tall with red eyes. Some of them described it as green, but some of them as brown. They thought it might be responsible for what happened to the car. Some other incidences. There were several additional reports of a large lizard-like creature in the months that followed the Davis sighting, and other incidences of unusual scratches and bite marks found on cars parked close to the swamp. Most of these are said to have occurred within three-mile radius of Bishopville Swamp, which seemed to be the epicenter of the Lizard Man sighting and alleged activity. At the time, local law enforcement officials reacted to reports of the Lizard Man with a mixture of concern and skepticism, stating that a sufficient number of sightings had been made by reliable people for them to believe that something tangible was being seen, but also that it was more likely to be a bear than a lizard man. Two weeks after Davis's sighting, the sheriff's department made several plaster casts of what appeared to be a three-toed footprint, measuring some 14 inches in length. Blackburn mentions the media circus that erupted after the story was picked up by wire services. The Lizard Man stories enthralled the public, who reacted with a mix of skepticism, fascination, and curiosity. Carloads of curious sightseers began to jam Brown Town Road as they came for a glimpse of Skateboard Swamp and, if they were lucky, the creature itself. Traffic on the road was steadily from the morning to midnight. Something local woodsmen say is a direct result of the sightings. The item newspaper reported on July 20th, 1988. To make things worse, the WCOS FM radio station out of Columbia offered a million dollar reward to anyone who could bring in the lizard thing alive. This not only attracted more outside attention, it also brought in scores of would-be hunters who were often armed and dangerous. According to the item article, four local friends each about 20 years old, brought rifles and trucks to the bridge in effort to do a little sightseeing and maybe collect the reward. When asked if he would try to spare the creature and thus meet the main requirement of collecting the money, Tony, Wright, Tony White replied, Damn straight, I wouldn't have to work a day in my life. Reporters, television crews, and photographers also began frequenting the area in growing numbers. As they fished for the lizard man, information from locals and shot rolls off a of film to accompany their articles and features. The July 20th edition of the Press Courier reported, The swamp was swamped with TV crews and other curious people hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. Blackburn is still puzzled about these reptilian human sightings, and in his book Lizard Man mentions the possibility of these sightings may somehow be related to the swamp apes or Bigfoot. Beyond the standard explanations that perpetually swirl around most cryptid sightings, other more fantastic theories have been proposed by researchers for these Lizard Man cases. These are not specific to the Bishopville Lizardmen. Rather, they are intended to account for any and all scaly or otherwise reptilian humanoids. These theories include rare skin diseases, 
highly evolved dinosaurs, a race of intelligent subterranean reptilians, and even government conspiracies. Some of these may seem extreme in what many consider to be purely cryptozoological case, but perhaps this is due in part to the very concept of the lizard man, one that defies the basic rules of biology. It's not a stretch to theorize that Bigfoot, if real, is simply an undocumented humanoid, sharing traits of both ape and man, since it is presumably a creature that could naturally occur in nature. But if a lizard man possesses traits of both human and reptile, then this becomes more difficult to rationalize. Okay, so these videos that you're going to see is the same occurrence taken on two different cameras. Um, my dear friend Zach uh, lives on the intercoastal um, waterway in Florida. And himself, his brother, and a couple of buddies are out fishing. And they start to notice something in the sky. At first, they thought it was a rocket, all right? And then it splits off. But then what happens is it splits off again and starts to, instead of going up, starts to turn and go across the sky like a going horizontally across the sky. Um, all of a sudden, another thing snaps off of it and sets behind a cloud uh and it happens numerous times and they've lived there for about three years now have never seen anything like it uh and it is very disturbing and i said bro what do you think it is and he said jeff i honestly think it is a uap it's a, definitely an unidentified aerial phenomena um, because of the way it moves, the way it acts, um, and everything around and about what you are going to see is, is absolutely disturbing because our rocket systems and shuttles, jets, and planes do not fly like this thing did. Or these things, I should say. Check this out.
All right, so you can see what I'm talking about. It splits, it then kind of one piece hides behind a cloud. Another piece splits off of that and starts horizontally flying across the sky. Um, it's really strange. The next video that you're going to see is from a different camera and a different angle of everything. And I can reassure you that this is disturbing. He is still freaked out about this. Um, they were like, they honestly were contemplating just going inside and not filming it, but they did. Check this out. All right, guys, so that is the both videos of the same experience. Um, it, it sucks kind of that it has to be shown on a 9x16 view that YouTube gives us instead of a 9x16 vertical. Uh, I tried to compress it and let you guys see the nine by 16 vertical way. Um, but it just won't, it won't play like that for some reason. Um, but man, you can see clearly that these phenomenons are just out of this world and strange. Uh, and, and like I said, the guys were a little freaked out actually quite quite a lot freaked out so guys i hope you enjoyed this upload as much as i enjoyed sharing this with you everyone thank you for supporting the channel your support is what makes this channel special and what continues to make it grow and go everyone please stay safe happy healthy and ever vigilant keeping an eye on our children our pets our family and friends these creatures are real they are out there and they are dangerous 
share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless you all.